anyway, good afternoon. Our, I guess you, you're watching this at some time where it may not be afternoon. But anyway, we continued and uh, ended up at uh, this, this, this area right here, power, power input. Now, we got to realize a couple of things. Power is energy per time, basically. Power makes things happen. A power equals production and profits. Okay, accomplishes the process objectives and can be added in a number of different mechanisms. And why don't I go to the slideshow so I can have my pointer effect here. So I get a pointer going, highlighter. And I want to make sure I have good color. So the important one is right in here. Power makes things happen. Power can be added by the fluid. Uh, excuse me. Power can be added to the fluid, sorry, by the process itself. So an example of that would be boiling. Or power can be added by a mechanical device, uh, such as an impeller or pump. Uh, power delivered to the process should be measured. Now, that may be difficult to do, okay, measuring power. Or it can also be calculated, or it could be both done both in both ways. But the idea is you do a power analysis of your process. Uh, whenever you were an engineering student in, high, in university, you may have studied pressure drop uh, and pipes. Uh, you had a good pipe flow instructor, then you studied pressure drop and pipes. That was a power analysis, essentially. Power times, excuse me, pressure drop, which is what you were doing uh, in your pipe class, times volumetric flow rate, if you look at the units, equals power. So again, doing pressure drop calculations for a pipeline is doing a power analysis. <clears throat> there is a significant uncertainty in the power consumed in the actual operations. Okay, and you should analyze the different sources of power because you may not realize what is actually doing your work for you. Power is a very important worker and should be understood. Right. So power analysis is basic basic engineering. Again, I said similar to pressure drop in a pipe. Identification of the worker, debugging the process. No power analysis is also why many scale up fail. Many scale ups fail because of power analysis. There's various ways of power being put in. One would be an agitated tank, uh, basically an impeller basically rotating equipment. You have the power number times the density, rotational speed cubed, diameter of the fifth power, and lo and behold, you have power. There's uh, calculations in my second book there, Industrial Mixing, that goes through uh, power calculations for an impeller. This is turbulent flow, by the way. This is dependent upon the uh, regime being turbulent. For laminar flow, however, things change a bit. Here, a turbulent flow density is very significant, this being the symbol for density, and, and uh, N being the rotational speed, and D the impeller diameter, and this being a power number, so to speak. Now, uh, so density is extremely important in turbulent flow. On the other hand, down here for laminar flow, we find out the power is proportional to viscosity. Rotational speed squared, d cubed. And there's this constant here. You can see, uh, just relatively speaking, I mentioned there are three variables in this, uh, in this type of work. One's fluid properties, one's operating conditions, and one's the geometry. And you can see the relative importance of fluid properties, exponent one, operating conditions, exponent three, and uh, diameter, which is exponent five. And you can quickly see that uh, impeller diameter is extremely important, right? Down here, we have the fact that uh, power is proportional to viscosity, rotational speed squared, 
and diameter cube. And again, you can see the relative importance of fluid properties, operating conditions, and diameter. Now, what's interesting is viscosity is not easily come by in the real world. You, uh, you may think that viscosity is a function of fluid property, but actually it's fluid property plus property of the flow field. So you may wish to calibrate your process. In other words, you go in with something that is a known viscosity, and you have the rotational speed and the diameter known, and you measure power, perhaps you measure current flow to a motor or something like that. And you calculate this K. Then when you run your material that you don't know the viscosity of, you have, again, the measurement of power. You have K from the previous calibration, and you can have the rotational speed and diameter. So this is a way of calculating viscosity. It is uh, an important way. Viscosity, again, is a uh, somewhat elusive term in actual operations. Then you have the static mixer, pressure drop times volumetric flow rate, much like a pipeline. And again, you might want to determine this K factor. If I take a look at gas, gas sparging operations, there's a pressure drop in gas sparging. First, there's a pressure drop across the sparge ring or sparge ladder or sparger times volumetric flow rate. So there's a power input right there. And then we have a power input due to the rise of the bubbles. You take, you take a tank here, you got your tank there, and the bubbles are down here, and they rise a certain height. Then uh, that height in there uh, gives you another power source. So in gas sparge systems, you have power input right around the sparge ladder do the pressure drop across the sparge ladder, and then you have the height rise of the bubbles as it goes through the, through the tank. Anyway, performing a power analysis allows you to weigh the different sources of power and judge their importance. Identifying why the process results change is critical process understanding. Anyway, various forms of power input gas sparging, boiling sprays, falling liquid curtain, shaking tables, natural convection, natural convection, perhaps due to chemical reaction, perhaps due to density differences. So here I uh, summarize some calculations I was doing. I have an impeller, and basically it's going at about 60 revolutions per minute. That's one second. It's one foot in diameter, power number is five. So I quickly calculate the horsepower. And then I had a relatively, I, I used a volume to it. I assumed that the power is consumed in certain uh, certain volume. So then I calculated the power per volume in the uh, thing that was going into the tank. And I can vary it, uh, one RPM, two RPM, one foot, two feet impellers. And you can see that I can put in very little power, absolutely nothing, and I can put in a whole bunch of stuff. So um, you should recognize that the power is not, uh, not necessarily coming from the impeller. Liquid jet. Basically, I have, say, a very large, well, large liquid jet, say 30 pounds per second, that's pounds mass per second. And if I have a velocity of 10 feet a second, basically, so in a sense, this is m dot, the mass flow rate times velocity squared, and that will give me a horsepower. So, uh, interesting. I can put in very little horsepower or very little power with a liquid jet, or I can put a whole bunch of uh, power in it at high velocities. Uh, the process can be, doesn't, doesn't rise in temperature, or the process with the large heat input 
can actually increase in temperature as well. Uh, moving on to static mixers, static mixers times volumetric flow rate. Again, I can put in a little power, I'm going to put in a whole bunch. Gas sparging, put in a little bit, put it in a whole bunch. Liquid boiling, boiling pot on the stove, I can put in a whole bunch of power. The only one that doesn't have much power input is a liquid drop. If I put a liquid drop in the, li uh, in the liquid, it's not going to be much. However, if I go with a liquid spray where this is multiplied by the number of droplets in the spray, I can put in a large uh, power input due to spraying the top surface of the tank. What we're talking about here is process physics. We have a number of different things in our reactor. We have perhaps a pump roll down loop with a spray, spray header. We can have an impeller. We can have gas sparging going on. We can have liquid jet mixing coming in. And there's, so there's a whole bunch of power sources out there. So, power input varies considerably depending upon mechanism and condition. Determination of dominant power input mechanism is needed for process understanding. Determination of dominant power input mechanism requires the calculation of power input from the various sources. Power input from the impeller, jets, gas sparging, boiling liquid space can be significant. Now, what the mixing people are involved with is power input from the impeller. And uh, you should recognize it's only one power source. Scale up is so difficult because the power analysis is hardly never done, is almost never done. Don't know what's doing the work and don't know where the work's being done. And again, I repeat to this uh, scale up of a chemical reactor. Serious questions arise. Reaction, reaction, where does the reaction take place? And how fast is the reaction? Reaction, reaction, where is the reaction? This dash ahead to this one, we'll, get, we'll go back to the reactor in a second. This is a question that was raised one time, maybe 12, 15 years ago. The guy we had on the motion, the, the engineer had on the motion process. And his question was, what do I do to this impeller to change my emulsions? The first question you pose, the first question is, how's the emulsion being made? Where is the emulsion being made? That helps an awful lot. And if you take high-speed movies, you will see that the impeller has trailing vortices that really rip things apart. So the emulsion could very easily be made here. Over here is a pump. It has an impeller as well. This thing is, this impeller here is maybe 300 RPM. This impeller in here may be 3,600 RPM. So just from the point of view of speed here, this is what, 12 times? No, 3 into 12 times faster. So even though the emulsion may initially start here, in this pump around loop, it may be polished or further size reduction occurs in the emulsion because of this pump. Now, as it goes around the top up here, it passes through a nozzle. Now, the nozzle up here uh, has a pressure drop, and it is also a power source. So we have a power we have power input due to the fact that there's a nozzle up there, pressure drop times volumetric flow rate. So we have three sources of power, and quite frankly, we don't know which one is doing the emulsion stuff. So you got to sit back and ask yourself, what's doing the work? Where is the process occurring? That's extremely important. Now then, if I take a look at my chemical reactor, this is sort of like a repeat of what we already did, right? So we can have an extensive list at the feed point, up the feed pipe, feed plume, boiling surfaces, walls of the tank. By the way, uh, walls of the tank can very easily partic uh, pers participate in the reaction. Metal walls, that's why you have glass line walls, is to prevent uh, the uh, metal walls from participating. 
and their reaction. Glass is fairly inert. One little story is pretty funny. It's actually it's not very funny. Um, the uh, they they had a, this particular company had a glass rind reactor. It was a really nasty uh, reacting reaction conditions. What happened was they had maintenance on this reactor and it was glass lined. And uh, unfortunately, the maintenance crew cracked the glass, dropped a hammer on the floor essentially cracked the glass. And overnight, they did a production run, and by early morning, they had a new hole in their reactor wall <laughs> due to the fact that the corrosiveness of the material inside the tank went into the crack and uh, corroded away the wall of the tank. Anyway, this is only a partial list of reaction zones. Each reaction requires different scale-up methods. Right, let's go back. All right, if I add this as my reaction zone, I would scale up on the characteristics of that jet. If I add heating coils in there for an endothermic reaction, I would pay attention to the surface area available for reaction per volume, right? Same thing with the number of particles. If the reaction was at the particle surface, i.e., the particles are off the tank bottom, their surfaces are exposed to reaction, exposed to processing, then I would be very much interested in knowing what would happen um, in the tank. Unfortunately, solids uh, are, have surfaces in which can cont be contaminated over time. You uh, may wish to put in a grinder system in here, a grinder high-speed disk, 5,000 RPM, and the purpose of that is to grind your catalyst surface. Maybe you take one catalyst particle and divide it into two. That gives you fresh surface that's unpoisoned. So one trick in a lot of reactors is to in situ change the nature of your material in the tank. Anyway. Material does not have to leave the reactor unreacted. Material does not leave the reactor unreacted like a backfire of a car. The reaction uh, location is not known. The risk to scale up is high. Most uh, chemical reactions are multi-phase. 25% of all chemical reactions are supposed to be between a gas and a liquid. So you're very much interested in the mechanics of the contacting phase. And we already said this, density is most important for turbulent flow viscosity. Viscosity is important for laminar flow. And the transition regime, both fluid properties are significant. We'll get to that in a second. Right here, the idea of power number versus Reynolds number. The power number is actually very similar to the drag coefficient, very similar to a drag coefficient. But if I look at the data, I can have viscoelastic fluids have this bump in here and come on down. Or if I shear thinning fluids, I could uh, come back up like that. So what happens is right in here, you have the transition regime. So what you have here is a, a regime of uncertainty. Right. You have laminar regime, which you can study up on and learn a lot. And the turbulent regime, which everybody knows, but the transition regime, the information is uh, really scant. And the transition regime is the regime that points to the need for engineers, people to make changes. Anyway, going back. Power input cannot be calculated accurately. Power should be measured. Power and power number are not constant, depending upon the environment which the impeller experiences. That's sort of like the power number is actually a drag coefficient. 
Power numbers are used inappropriately to calculate power input. And I would just say that most calculated powers or uh, power numbers or power results are off by 30 to 100 percent, maybe even more. The regime and the transition regime, the power number curves are not particularly well defined. You're going to vary by a factor of five. This is a quote by uh, a sales rep one time, a very knowledgeable sales rep. Whatever power you think you're putting into the system is not what is actually being utilized. And their variations in power can be caused by Gaspard systems, systems which cavitate. These impellers generally don't cavitate that much. Uh, systems in the transition regime, unbaffled systems, systems with complex geometries, uh, complex viscosities, systems with uh, complex internals, multiple, uh, multiple impellers with varying baffling. So we have powers distributed. It's important to understand how power is distributed in the tank and how and where it's dissipated. Fluid motion. <clears throat> well, fluid motion is a wonderful thing. Uh, causes contacting between the materials, causes motion process objectives to be accomplished. Specific uh, processes require specific flow pro uh, properties, which dictate the equipment used. So one of the interesting things about flow regimes, um, well, it uh, tells you how fluids will behave under motion it tells you how the materials will be contacted. So flow regimes is a, you can think of it as different contacting, re, uh, contacting regimes. Processes should not be treated as black boxes. That's very important. Flow regime is the first thing, you, one of the first items you should find out about your process. It's easier to troubleshoot a process when uh, one knows what's supposed to happen you will likely encounter problems in mixing. And in laminar flow, uh, the addition of two materials can often remain separated and do not mix. That's tough, right? So single phase, how many regimes do we have? Well, we have transition, laminar, and turbulent. So there's three. If we have two phases, now we got to watch out. We got void fraction, we got interfacial tension, and we have gravity. Right? And maybe it's neutral. This is really density, right? You can have very high density differences or very low density differences. Just for fun, we have laminar turbulent transition, three times three. Already we have nine. But just say we have a variation of fact two different flow regimes for void fraction. There's probably a lot more than just two, but for these calculations, it's just pick up two. Interfacial tension, let's say there's two of those, one high, one low. And gravity, we'll say there's two as well. So if we look at the number of flow regimes, you will take two times two times two gets eight, and then nine, we have 72 different process flow regimes. So it gives you an idea of how level of difficulty you may have. Well, let's try three phases. So you have three times three times three, so that's 27, and then you have two, two, and two. So you could potentially have uh, 260 different types of flow regimes. So what this is really trying to tell you is there's huge variations in nature, huge variations in nature. And the differences of flow regimes can be subtle, can be subtle. For example, you have a gas barge system. Uh, when the gas reaches the surface, it bubbles. That's one regime. When the gas doesn't reach the surface at all, that's another regime. And the question I find always intriguing is uh, how many different types of snow are there? You know, in the South, in the southern states of U.S., the United States, we have uh, we don't have much snow. We have ice storms, 
But up in uh, Norway, I was watching a movie at one point in time, and the detective wanted to know how many different types of snow there was. It was a murder mystery. And so you can see, I think the conclusion was that there were 96 different types of snow. So this is a really good example uh, given to me by, well, maybe I shouldn't say. We'll keep that company quiet. See, I, I get a lot of stuff. I know I've met a lot of people, talked a lot about a lot of stuff. And uh, I can't really tell you some of these people. But anyway, this is coming from you all. This company was progressive enough to do some studies with a comb bottom tank. They had baffling, they had a pitch blade turbine, and then they wisely had a tickler impeller at the bottom down there. Now the comb bottom uh, was unbaffled. That's very important. So when they were running, there, they run three different levels. One level there, one level there, and another level up here. Okay. And this stuff just went around like this. This is uh, very poor mixing, by the way. So what happened is the crystallization regime went back on itself and back on itself and back on itself. So the growth, very large crystals occurred, right? So everything was wonderful. Filtration time was done uh, very quickly, maybe an hour at most. Then the uh, liquid level went up to the baffles. Now, that completely altered the flow in the tank, completely changed. Okay. The uh, feed was coming in at the top, and the feed it went everywhere. Here, the feed circled back on itself. Here, it just went everywhere. Crystal size dropped significantly. Right. Filtration time became 24 hours. So, what I'm looking for uh, is this type of filtration process, I mean, excuse me, uh, rotational process to make large crystals make my filtration simpler. Again, filtration is going to be difficult. It's going to cause you difficulties and to go, it's best to, how can I say this? This is a fundamental here. You don't want to use this. If you want large crystals, you don't want to use this system here. Got it? <laughs> But if you do use this system on scale up, you're going to have a really difficult time, and you're probably not going to be very successful. So, in a sense, for large crystals, this is a really bad geometry, right? Then over here, I have this wonderful geometry that gives me lar very large crystals. And so, why beat yourself over the head with a lousy geometry? Find a more optimum geometry and use that one. Right. Anyway, let's talk about the famous Fodler design. Fodler design. Uh, basically, you have a central impeller in here, and it looks like a chicken leg, right? Deformed chicken leg. Anyway, Fodler design. And then they can have all kinds of ba uh, baffles up here. They can have a beaver tail baffle, which is this golden. Or they can have their famous H baffle, right? So anyway, we have the shaft. <clears throat> Let's change colors. Now, the reason why this geometry is glass lined, right? The impeller's glass lined. Everything's glass lined. The reason why this impeller is so popular is way, way, way back when, this is the only thing that would hold glass. And I think what they did, they took a piece of pipe and smashed it flat, and then they get glass coated it, and it worked. And the reason why this impeller actually works better than you might anticipate is its D over T ratio uh, can be 0.7. In other words, it's a huge impeller in there relatively tank diameter. Now, that's one of the major advantages of this Fowler design. It has a large 
diameter impeller in it. As a result, uh, if I run different liquid levels in here, I will have different different behaviors depending upon liquid level. So this device, this agitated tank, uh, with father design, uh, may spin the fluid right up along the wall, much like this would. Up the bottom down here is unbaffled, much like this. However, I fill it up, I reach the baffles, and I may have this situation here. And you have probably significant variations in performance due to liquid height in here. And uh, what can you say? That's the way it is. Except for the fact that none of that information is available to you. You don't know how the process is going to vary with, high, with liquid fill height. And as a result, uh, you know, there is uh, a question about whether scale-up using this piece of equipment will be uh, a good scale-up. It's a very useful device, right? 50% of the pharmaceutical industry uses it. So obviously it can't be bad. Uh, but not, it can't be bad, but it's probably still poorly understood. Well, the different volume regimes is fairly unimportant. Foaming, caking, coking regimes. Mixing geometries. Well, let's see what we got here. An effective, we, remember we're dividing it into two regimes here. We have effective geometries, which we'll put as big E, and over here we have in, ineffective geometries, i.e. So when we have effective geometries, uh, that impeller will cause motion in all three directions, a very wonderful thing. And uh, mixing and contacting is needed when you bring two materials together, and there needs to be a specific mechanism to mix these materials. These are basic geometries that mix for the first time. Turbulent geometry is the most common, least costly, and not appropriate for laminar mixing, right? However, the laminar geometries are most versatile, perform well in turbulent applications, but are much more costly. You're looking for uh, three-dimensional motion. It's uh, also apparent that there are many useful designs in mixing, and not so many useful designs as well. As I said, some recommended designs, hollow blade, Smith & Peller, hydrofoils, fluid foils, helical ribbon. The objective is to have low power input, good distribution of power. You, you put in low power, but it's distributed very well, and you have good fluid motion. And uh, we already talked about these, right? And it's, of course, bad designs are these. You don't have an impeller on the tank bottom, for one thing. Uh, this is not common. This is what we were calling the universal mixer. This this helical ribbon will mix both turbulent and laminar, so it's a wonderful device. Process objectives should match the impeller used. Different impellers have different objectives. Good mixing contact does not require high power, right? Objectives should not be in conflict with the type of impeller. So here we have a general listing of impellers here. And what can I say? Uh, just uh, I would not want to use this. Primarily, it's radial flow. Uh, causes compartmentalization. Point impeller, well, I, I don't know. You then put holes in these things. Engineers always want to put a hole in it, see what happens. Nothing happens. Anyway, these are very good impellers, the hydrofoil, the pitch blade turbine, <coughs> and the propeller. This is a distal turbine. <coughs> Actually, now this would be, uh, take this blade and make it into a pipe. So it was flat, but now you want it shaped like that. Well, actually, you want it cupped in the direction of rotation, cut this way. 
So it's rotating this way. And you want to cup to, that would be the Smith impeller. Do we have the Smith impeller coming up? Hmm. And we don't have the Smith impeller. I'll show it to you when we get into the gas area. Okay. Now, uh, this thing, the salt tooth, um, really looks fancy with the uh, teeth. The teeth are bent up and down, so oftentimes you see... Uh, the impeller like this, basically, with some teeth up and teeth down. Every time there's a, a tooth here, there'll be a trailing vortex, and it's very, disperses stuff very well, and that's called a cow's impeller. Okay. Hydrofoil will save you a whole bunch of money in pumping, as opposed to the propeller or the pitch blade. Now, up here we have a disc impeller. That's looks like a fairly useless impeller, doesn't it? What do we got here? But what happens is along a disc, you have the disc here. You have these vortices that are forming. So on the top portion of the blade there, you have these vortices forming. How do I know that? Well, a long time ago, uh, they used these things, spinning electrodes, electrochemistry, and this chap uh, very uh, determined the flow field was a very uniform vortices coming out right here, right, all along this thing. I was at a company, and the company asked me, uh, one of the chaps asked me, how do you make uh, uniform drops? And I basically said, well, to make uniform drops, you might try a simple disc. And uh, there are vortices along the top of the disc and vortices along the bottom of the disc. It's very helpful to find out where the vortices are. And they're all the same. Symmetry-wise, these vortices are all the same. So when a drop enters the one location here, it'll experience the same flow field as it discharges. As a result, the drop seeing the same flow field over time as you grind a drop down smaller and smaller, it will all the drops will see all the same flow fields and uh, you approach uniformity that way. So I was at this company and I said, why don't you try this spinning electrode uh, disc sort of thing, explain the vortices. Three, uh, three years later, I went back to the same company and ran across this guy. A uh, guy I talked to, and he says, so, it worked. And I said, what worked? <laughs> and he explained to me the, uh, the disc making uniform drops. So I don't know what happened, uh, whether he made a lot of money at that. It's a chemical company, so let's hope that they did something with it. Anyway, some other impellers out there, uh, swept back impeller. Basically, do I have a picture of that? I don't have a picture of that. Swept back impeller is where the blades are swept back, so to speak. Right? And the reason why you'd want them swept back is anything caught in this impeller will eventually work itself off. Okay. Say in the fiber industry or the paper industry, you have a lot of swept back impellers. Hopefully, you're rotating this way, right? Because if you rotate the other direction, it uh, will ball the material up. So oftentimes it doesn't matter about impeller rotation. But if it's a swept back impeller in the fiber industry, then we have problems. As I said earlier up here, the distal turbine, what you want is have the blades cupped in the direction of rotation, not flat. So this is primarily used in gas. So the gas comes up, it hits this disc. Now that's not really a disc, it's actually a baffle, right? It hits the baffle and then goes out to the vortices. And there's vortice there and there's a vortice up here. And those vortices uh, make very tiny bubbles, very effective bubbles. And you get a very good uh, gas-liquid contacting out of that. And the more blades you have, right? Let's go back here. The more blades you have, the better off you are. 
up to a certain point, right? So the more blades, the more vortices. You don't want to have too many blades and you don't want to have too few blades. So this gives rise to what might be referred to as Goldilocks concept in engineering. An engineer is out in the woods and he ran across this impeller. And the impeller, he saw three impellers sitting there. One with too few blades. So he looked at it and he says, ah, too, too few blades. Then the engineer went and looked at the other impeller and it was saturated with blades. You know, they were very close together, very saturated with blades. And he looked at that impeller and he says, ah, too many, too many blades. So we have too few blades and we have too many blades. And then he went and found an impeller and he said the blade separation was just right. So he had the impeller with the blades. That was just right. Sort of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. One, one porridge was too hot, another porridge was too cold. The third porridge was just right. And that often applies to engineering. Uh, thought to throw in a little bit of humor in there. Uh, submerged uh, impeller, basically, uh, if I take uh, clay, you know, clay, I'm trying to suspend clay, but the impeller is uh, buried into the clay. And basically, when they started it up with a flat blade in there, and I torqued the blade, it break off and buried. This is the impeller buried in the clay. So they got thinking about it, and they Obviously, they're going to do some innovation. So a long a time ago, they came up, I don't know how many years ago, they came up with a spring impeller. In other words, at the end of the shaft, they mounted a truck spring. So when the uh, system would rotate, the spring would stretch and it would not break. So you have wonderful, wonderful things. In other words, it may come as astonishment to you. You don't have to accept the status quo. You don't have to accept what is available to you. You can modify processes to your advantage. And the paper industry came along and had swept back impellers. Clay industry came along and had a coral impeller. And of course, you have the retreat blade impeller for the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So you have different different designs for different different designs for different uh, objectives or duties. Now, this high solitude impeller, if you go home and look at your fan, you have to you have a fan and this might be a boxed fan. And basically, say at home you have this fan. And if I take a look at it, it has a huge blade here and it has another huge blade there and it has another huge blade there. I don't know if you looked at your box fan or not at home, but they're huge blades. And why it's called a high solitude impeller is because you can't see through it. You know, it's, it's basically. So on the side, it may be huge, it may be a little waffle blades like that. Anyway, attached to a hub. Now, what's interesting about equipment, uh, you can give the same equipment to one group of people and then give the same equipment to another group of people. And uh, one group, same same duty, same duty, doing the same thing. One group says, oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread. We need to have it. And another uh, group will say, oh, geez, get rid of this thing. It ain't working well. So again, same piece of equipment, pretty much the same duty. One group says it's fantastic, and the other group says baloney. It's uh, not a good. The situation is, is that in this case, I had uh, one person said they used this for gas dispersion, and it worked so bad that they took it out. It took them about a week to get it in and get it back out. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then another person comes along and informs me that this is this is really great and I should not uh, cast dispersions on this impeller because it really worked well. What can I say, folks? You know, did it work or didn't it work? What was it? Why were there such differences between these two groups of people evaluating this impeller? 
And I, quite frankly, think both people who I talked to at this point, they were both reliable folk. So, anyway, impellers in planetary motion, very important, especially if you're making whipped cream. So you now have an assignment. I want you to get some whipping cream, whipping cream, and I want you to put it in the bowl. And then you have your whip, uh, your impeller sitting here. So you have your impeller and it's spinning around. Now then, what will happen is you'll have whipped cream over here, and this will probably be just simply cream. Not whipped cream, but cream. Okay. So you need to move the impeller around in the tank here. So you have a, a, a duty to uh, watch how solid, basically, uh, planetary motion, how the impeller uh, behaves, right? Now that you've whipped cream and you filled up the entire bowl with very good whipped cream, and you put your mixer over here to the side and it's still on and everything's wonderful, you put sugar in here. Now the sugar will stay here for an awful long time. However, if the machine is in planetary motion, the impeller will come over and mix it in. So the, this planetary motion is very important, right? So if I'm a, a planetary, planetary motion, I look down on the tank, right? And the impeller is over here, then it's over here, and it's over here, and it's over here. So after a while, the planetary action moves the impeller. So it covers the entire tank, which is obviously needed if you have, this is particularly important if you have Bingham plastics, stuff with yield points, uh, important in uh, cosmetics uh, maybe, where you have some material and yield points. Anyway. Back and forth impellers, that means uh, basically, you can think of it as a spoon, right? You go back and forth, back and forth with your coffee cup. And eventually, back and forth mixers will mix. Cream in your coffee, it doesn't mix, but when you put a spoon in there, it mixes quite rapidly, right? So back and forth, back and forth. Or up and down. See, you can have up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Let's see. Simple disk, I said, the, uh, generates uniform vortices, makes uniform drops. Compartmentalization happens with radio flow. Direction of rotation usually does not affect the results, except uh, Smith impeller, and uh, obviously the swept back impellers in particular, swept back impellers. I have the Smith impeller here, right? Let's talk a little bit about that. So the Smith impeller is like this. Uh, you have the disc, and then you have the blades mounted on the disc. So now we were working, uh, I was working with Again, a company I can't talk to you about. Uh, and they were taking out their flat blade disc thing and replacing it with a Smith impeller. I was lying awake that night thinking about that, and I said, you know, I bet the uh, maintenance crew will flip the impeller. In other words, the maintenance crew will come in and say, you know, this just doesn't look right. It's not streamlined. It will look, it's better, look, it should be like this. Now, this is a disaster for gas dispersion, right? You want it cupped in the direction of rotation. So what happened was these guys in the maintenance flipped the impeller or they basically wound up putting this thing in. <coughs> and this is a disaster. Anyway, 
Is that okay? Was that socially correct? I'm not sure. Uh, who cares? Anyway. What else can we say? Well, let's talk a little bit about the Smith impeller again. With vertical plates, what happens with vertical blades, what happens is you have a vortex down here and a vortex down here. Now, these vortices are low pressure regions, and they collect, la they collect gas. And what happens if you put in a whole bunch of gas and effectively flood it, you no longer have separate vortices, but you have a large gas cavity in the back. So the gas cavity fills up in here. Now then, the reason why the curved blades work so well <coughs> is you have still the vortex up here and the vortex up there, but you don't have any, uh, this bow bowing in here prevents these things from getting together and forming a large cavity. In fact, some designs are, are rather very cupped like that. I think the Scuba design is, looks like that. Some designs are. This could actually be uh, very similar to the famous arrowhead impeller. Way, way back in 1940s, there was an arrowhead impeller. And if I'm not mistaken, it was for gas liquid systems. And the thing looked like this, looked like an arrowhead. And if run forward or run backward, you would have different performance. Running this thing, if I ran this thing that direction, I would have essentially this over here. And I would have a good gas disperser. Now, I don't know if they ran those arrowhead impellers or not that direction, but the design existed and it was used. and. Um, Interesting, they may have not known why it worked, but that certainly possibly did work, and that's why they used it. If you're an engineer and you expect that something's going to work, it may not work that way at all. And you may not, you have a very good performance data, but you don't know why it's so great. So you have the two, two bad extremes. One, the equipment doesn't work, but you had a real strong belief that it would. As opposed to that, you have the belief that if equipment wouldn't work, and it turns out working fantastically. That's the way things are oftentimes. You can't, you can't get around that. Pumping numbers, this is, I don't know if it's fairly important. They pump all the same. We'll skip that. Laminar impellers. Laminar power, laminar impellers fill the entire tank. Now uh, you have two designs: helical ribbon, and this is actually the power number for a helical ribbon, and the pumping number for a helical ribbon. If you go back to my first book, uh, the one with the ugly green blue cover on it. You could possibly pick out more information about pumping numbers and power numbers. Anyway, you're looking for a good distribution of power and fluid motion. However, unfortunately, right, it's easy to have power input, poor fluid motion in the formation of caverns. Let's take a look. Again, the whipped cream. You're going to go home, hopefully, and buy some whipping cream, and you're going to get out your mixer. And I wanted you to just play with it, right? Play with the whipped cream, see what happens. Uh, use planetary motion. You might add more impellers, right? Don't use turbulent mixers, laminar applications. Highly viscous reaction, uh, reactors should not be mixed with turbulent geometries. What you have here is an example of what happens. Here I have an impeller, it's well mixed cavern, and up here it's stagnant. And if I use a pitch blade turbine, same thing will happen. 
Then I come along and increase the diameter down here. See the diameter up here is kind of small. Come along and increase the diameter a bit. Your cavern size will grow. If I go all the way to the wall, your cavern will disappear. I mean, it will be all a mixer type situation occurring. So what we're talking about is D over T ratio, the diameter of the impeller to the diameter of the tank. That's your friend. If you were doing, you would, should pay attention to the D over T ratio. D over T ratio goes from uh, 1 sixth to 0.98. Performance, uh, performance of the impeller is determined by the D over T ratio. Inferior impellers, inferior impeller designs with large D over T ratios will outperform superior impellers of small D over T. D over T does not account for changes in scale. I mean, example of D over T changes improve performance. Actually, this is a very poor performance because you have stagnated stagnation regions. Lots of polymer reaction reactors are like that. So D over T ratio present in all processes should be recognized, should be used to advantage. You can think of the impeller being an area generator and the tank being an area storage and the tank also being an area destroyer. Small impellers just don't make it. I mean, D over T ratio is so small, it doesn't matter. The impeller's there and it doesn't matter. So you have the D over T ratio in blending operations, selectivity, flow at the wall, heat transfer, froud numbers, buoyancy, recirculation, driving force for mass transfer, driving force of the impeller to the storage capacity of the tank, differentiates between impeller processes and tank processes, and can be used perhaps as a diagnostic tool. D over T ratio is poorly understood, often not studied, it should be studied. There's an optimum D over T ratio for most processes. Mixing, da, 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 da. Anyway, let's go on to mixing, 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 mixing. First case, we really ought to decide what mixing looks like, right? So let's just go back and see what we can dig up in our arrangement here of different items. Let's try uh, static mixers here and just to give you an idea what mixing looks like. <clears throat> now, this is the, uh, what is this? The, uh, Forget exactly. Solser, yeah. Solser Chemtech static mixers. Now, what I really want to do is, uh, this is excellent tape. These guys are wonderful people making wonderful pieces of equipment and great stuff. Okay? And we're going to watch this movie and I'm going to comment on it as we go through. So they're going to take, this is an exploded view of uh, static mixer. So what they've done is, uh, if I can find it here, they're taking red and white. They're taking red and white, initially red on one side, white on the other. Basically, if you go back, uh, let's go back a bit. There you go. See, you have the red on one side and the white on the other. There is no mixing when these two streams meet. The red stays on one side. The white stays on the other side. You see that? Anyway, so now you're going to pump it down through one of their fantastic static mixers. And again, as far as I know, I would have to say this is one of the best static mixers out there. Right? So I, you know, I, I'm not a. It looks very well. So they pump it uh, red and white down a pipe. Then they section it and polish it up. Okay, give you an idea of what mixing looks like. Now, first thing we want to make sure 
is that this is laminar mixing. This is not turbulent mixing. And you can see at this point in time, after one static mixer, there's hardly any mixing occurring. After two or three static mixers, you're getting some better cross mixing. You also notice the interface is growing well, right? So, anyway. So what we really truly want to do is we need to count. And right now, I think we're up around four static mixers. And you will find that when you finish, if you go through this by yourselves, uh, you will find that uh, maybe eight. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe ten static mixers, and the process is mixed. All right. As I said, uh, mixing is, de is a dependent upon number, number of revolutions to mix, the number of static mixers. That's all there is. Okay. Here, let's see what we actually have here. Go quickly. Now, this is turbulent. This is a expanding jet. And you notice that it's 15 degrees, and that will tell you immediately it's a Turbulent jet. So it hits a static mixer, hits another static mixer that's orientated 90 degrees. And after three static mixers, the system is well mixed or excellent, mixed fairly well. Turbulent flow mixing is not that difficult. This is, uh, I guess, gas liquid, right? Gas liquid contacting. And they'll show you how things go well. Here I have, I uh, guess I ought to back up here a bit. Start right in here. Here I have gas coming through a static mixer. First thing you want to notice is horizontal. Okay. And when it comes out of the static mixer, it's fair, the gas is fairly well dispersed. If I continue on, however, there's starting to be a separation going on. After about two pipe diameters, this is one diameter, and that's about down here. After two di pipe diameters, the gas and the liquid are beginning to separate by gravity. Obviously, gas liquid reactors should not be run horizontally. They should be run vertically, right? Got that? So now then, we're going to go and hit it with another static mixer. The diameter has dropped down into half, perhaps. So we have a half diameter static mixer, pipe down. And in here, you can see the vortices that are filled up with vortex systems. And this is what's uh, causing the dispersion of the gas. And at the very end, you can see the gas being fairly well dispersed. Now, by dropping the pipe diameter by a half, right, you've increased the pressure drop across that thing. Pressure drop varies with one over the fifth power, diameter to the fifth power. Pressure drop varies with diameter of fifth power. So, uh, two to the fifth power is a very large number. The previous static mixer was putting in low power. This static mixer is putting in very high, high levels of power, power. And the dispersion produces much smaller. Again, you should look at things from the point of view of power input. Here we have uh, basically, what do we have here? Our famous uh, exothermic reaction reactor where we're taking out a whole bunch of heat. They have this tube in here which functions as two things. One, their static mixer, and two, their heat exchanger. Now, sometimes you fill up the entire pipe with metal beads and fuse them together. That will give you very high pressure drop and also very good heat transfer. That's another way of doing heat transfer. Very rapid heat transfer. 
Here's an example of, uh, let's go back here. Here they're adding two materials. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the viscosity levels are. I think they're different viscosities. Anyway, you can see there's absolutely no mixing. This is typically a mistake that's made often is when you have a pipeline reactor, you have parallel feeds. These two, these two streams are not going to mix. What you need to do is take the stream, have it in, come in per perpendicular, hit the far wall, and that way it will spread the stream out into a high shear zones in the wall, and you will have much better mixing going on. So then it hits a static mixer, and all bets are then off, and you get very good mixing eventually. This is a decolorant. Again, a very fine stream of decolorant. Uh, and as it gets mixed in, it's no mixing in a straight pipe, right? Typical, no mixing situation. And it goes through a series of uh, static mixers. And eventually, the solution becomes clear, basically. The optical, uh, since it's clear, then it's essentially mixed, completely mixed. And again, it's only 10 static mixers for this type of mixer. All right. Here's bubbles. We should back this up just a touch. So you have a bubble, or excuse me, this is not a bubble, but a drop. You have a drop, and understanding how it breaks up, the drop initially looks like it's being cut in half. The drops are being cut in half. Uh, and eventually, it will reach a certain size level, which is called the equilibrium drop size. You can't get any smaller. The uh, Weber number, this drop size is controlled by the Weber number, the uh, difference between surface forces and pressure drop or velocities, basically. And we've reached a certain size below which it will no longer go. Now then, we're going to increase the power input significantly. And the first thing you want to look at is the drops are no longer cut apart. First off, you probably reduce the diameter of the pipe here by a factor of five, maybe a factor of four. That means the power input went up enormously. Not only that, you have a area difference, and the area difference is causing an acceleration to occur, right? Low area, small, uh, high velocity, big area, low velocity. So here the particles, uh, the drops are actually being pulled apart. Now, that would be important, watching out for the rheology. If you pull something apart that's viscoelastic, it could very easily spring back. But in this case, it doesn't spring back, and you have what is, you might, might consider a <coughs> Anyway, let's take a look at this, right? We want to make sure we understand what's going on here, because uh, we don't. So you have the, going through, you have significant power input going on, reduction. And when you come out of this static mixer, you have uh, very large drops. Oof, look at that. But for the most part, the drops are fairly uh, small, and they're probably fairly uniform. These larger drops are probably a rarity. One of the things you should take to note, though, it's very important, is we have this static mixer, but what's coming out is not mixed, right? 
you have some of the material over here, and you have some of the material over here. This is not a well-mixed system. And so you pass it through another static mixer. And lo and behold, uh, we got one, two, three, four, four static mixers. Then we have nice uniform drops. Excuse me, nice uniform concentration of drops. So what do we have here? Hmm. This is uh, not very important, actually. We can move on for that. <coughs> now, there is a claim uh, that static mixers may be used for solids. Here they're showing you yellow and black falling straight in a tube and you, they're unmixed when they went in, they're fairly unmixed when they leave. You throw it through a static mixer back and forth, and they mix quite well. The problem with this is that if this was operating under a continual system and there was a significant, significant abrasive material, your static mixer may actually disappear on you, right? The static mixer would be essentially a braid of the way. I'm going back here to show you something else. Let's see, was it here? Sorry for this. What I want to show you is this situation here. Right. Ah, missed it. Maybe I'll find it a little bit later. Anyway, let's go on down to the end of this and give you an idea of how big these static mixers become. Here is an example of flow computations through the static mixer. Now, this video is actually what. 20 years old or so, I've had it a long time, and you can see these computations. The computations are only getting better and better, right? Now we give you an idea how big these static mixers can be. They can be quite big, right? Another example, this obviously will be for a gas system. Pickling and the surface preparation. It's a big, big static mixer here. I guess it would be for uh, gases again. The size of a piece of equipment is really determined by how 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 well you can, <coughs> or uh, how size difficulty, and shipping. Uh, Basically, a bridge can only t take such wide load, or a tunnel can only have such a wide load. So you have uh, you have to consider that in the d design of your equipment as whether you can get it to the plant or not. We were talking about the surface uh, impeller processes <coughs> versus tank processes. Let's take a look at, I'll show you a quick video on uh, <coughs> Now what you have here is a pitch plate turbine. <coughs> and it's being fed with large glob of oil. And the phase is typically uh, water, basically water. And I'll just show you, you have very large glob out here in the middle of the tank not being dispersed. <coughs> However, as soon as it gets near the impeller, <coughs> there's a vortex at the, along the edge of this impeller, which then disrupts, causes significant drop breakage. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the droplets are significantly smaller. 
<coughs> under different different Reynolds numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank <laughs> you.